Welcome back to the Anytime Show. I'm your host, Dustin Dai, broadcasting from my Russian Dhaka. I'm joined today by... The word is pronounced Dacha. Dacha. C-H. Dacha. Well, uh, thank you for calling me out. I, people might sure. realize I'm not actually in a Russian Dacha. Um, I'm joined today it's by... a beautiful living room. Well, thank you. The unfortunate lighting isn't so great in this corner. Um, but this is what I have to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm joined today by the CV star professor emeritus of Russian and East European studies, Michael Katz. Uh, thank you for being here today. You're welcome. Um, you previously did a uh, interview with the Path to Follow podcast where you talked about your uh, background. And I um, highly recommend my viewers go check that out. Um, so my first question for you is, what initiated your uh, interest in Russia and Russian literature? Well, it was the launching of the Soviet Union's first satellite, Sputnik, in the late 1950s. And my high school, Horace Mann School in New York City, added Russian to their curriculum. And I decided that never having studied a modern foreign language, I had studied several years of Latin, that I would try Russian, in part because lots of Americans at the time were talking about studying Russian, uh, hoping to compete with the Soviet Union. The cover of, I think it was Newsweek, or US News and World Report at one time, carried the headline, uh, Ivan knows English. Why doesn't Johnny know Russian? So this is one Johnny who started studying Russian. And I studied it for two years in high school and then went to Colby College one summer to do a summer school, followed that by my going to Williams College in Massachusetts, where I was the first Russian major and after my freshman year at college, my mentor, who was a countess, actually, a Russian countess, managed to find me a scholarship so that I could go to the Soviet Union. And after a summer in Russia, I came back and I knew what I was going to be involved with for the rest of my life. I didn't know how, whether I was going to be a spy or a lawyer or a teacher a researcher, but I knew that I was going to be involved with Russia. So your initial, I guess, foray into the language was because of competition with the Russians at the time. Um, at the same time, I began reading the Russian classics in English and decided that, wow, this is good stuff. And if I study Russian long enough, <clears throat> I'll be able to read this stuff in the original, which eventually okay. I did. So you had that other interest that helped you along. I did. Uh, what was the first book you read that got you? Crime and Punishment. Crime and Punishment, okay. And, you, mm -hmm. and then I read, language. then I read Karamazov. Wow. And from there I went on to Tolstoy and read Anna Karenina and War and Peace, Thanks. the four biggies in Russian 19th century fiction. Yeah, the, the rest kind of seemed lightweight after that. Uh, uh, not exactly lightweight, but... Um, <laughs> Those are the big ones, though. Yes. So can you give a... Well, how old were you when you first read The Brothers Karamazov? Probably 16. Oh, wow. Uh, I attempted to read it for the first time in my early 20s, and I got about mm -hmm. halfway through in... in didn't retain much. I didn't really, it's like my, my eyes were going over the lines without really it, understanding, you know, sinking yeah. in. I think mm -hmm. the first time I read it all the way through, I was in my mid thirties. Um, I think it's a book to read once a decade for sure. Um, so I'm, I'm coming up on 40. Um, so it's, uh, I'm due to reread it and Thankfully, there's a new translation I heard that's coming out. And you did hear right. right. I happen to have an advanced copy of it right in front of me. Oh, can I see it? Sure. 
Let's see if it that looks beautiful. That's beautiful artwork. Thank you. I chose, I well, I didn't choose it. I suggested the design to their art department, and that's what they came up with. Keep my fingers out of the way. Beautiful. Um, I happen to have a trans another translation on me that uh, this is, uh, I don't know if you can see it so well. This is the Vietnamese translation. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I got it in. Well, in Vietnam, uh, and uh, do you read Vietnamese? No, no. This was this no. was my sixth tour of Nam, but I still can't speak the language. Uh, uh -huh. But I found this in a little bookstore, and the the cashier was like, "Can you read that?" And I was like, "Of course I can." So <laughs> the brothers Karam was off, uh, but uh -huh. this is unfortunately there's some mist in my dacha that's preventing it from coming in clearly. But just beautiful artwork. I can see it, yeah. And a beautiful, a beautiful layout inside. Let me find some of the. Um, Does it have the, illustrations inside? Not quite illustrations, but just kind of beautiful uh, design of the. Uh huh. Uh, so I'm kind of proud of this possession. It's around sixteen dollars, US. <laughs> Actually, uh, I've recently decided to collect. Uh, translations of it when I travel because mm -hmm. um, a former dean at the university I work at, um, he would uh, collect translations of the Rubaiyat. He had like thousands of them. I think it's the largest oh, collection gosh. ever amassed. Um, but when he traveled, he, he just picked up and I was like, well, what book do I like enough that I could do that with? And I was like, oh, well, the, the Brothers Karabaz. <laughs> So that was, that was a little aside that I didn't intend to mention, but uh, so let's just talk about the book. What, what is it about? Um, who are the characters? Just for a quick overview for people who are unfamiliar with it. Sure. It's about three and a half brothers. The half is a stepbrother um, who was fathered by the brother's own father, but uh, with a different mother, and the three brothers plot against their father. He's um, a drunkard and a voluptuary, and they finally decide that they're going to do him in, and all three of them are in some way culpable for wishing him dead. And I don't want to give it away, but um, he is murdered during the course of the novel. You find that out right away, the beginning. It starts by saying the terrible events that happened in our little town several years ago, namely the murder of uh, Dmitri, uh, not Dmitri, of Fyodor Karamazov. Um, and that triggers the novel, which is an investigation of the background to his murder uh, and shows how each one of the three brothers is in some way culpable of the parasite. And uh, it ends with a trial of one of the brothers and he's, uh, well, I won't, say anymore okay it's a good it's a good all Dostoevsky's novels are murder mysteries and this one is a murder mystery in the sense that you know who it has been murdered but you don't know who did it or why he did it and of course the most famous scene is the um the Grand Inquisitor part that yeah. seems to be, even if you haven't read the book, you're at least familiar with that uh, mm -hmm. tale. Um, or if you've heard of about it in a Western Civ class, maybe that's, I think that was my first introduction to the book was in Western Civ. My professor mentioned his car broke down in some flyover state, maybe Iowa. And uh -huh. <laughs> uh, he had to spend a few days in a motel and he found a copy of the book in a in a <laughs> local gas station and he said if it wasn't uh -huh. for that book uh, I don't know what I if I would have uh, stayed sane during that but um 
you, you mentioned the uh, Grand Inquisitor part, and can you give a brief overview of what that is? Well, it's often excerpted, which is unfair to Dostoevsky because he spends a good part of the following chapters refuting the arguments of the Grand Inquisitor. The Grand Inquisitor makes the case that Christ left men with freedom, and that was a terrible burden, and that they, the Grand Inquisitor and fellow churchmen, uh, have taken away man's freedom and instead given him happiness. And happiness for the average mortal man, says the Inquisitor, is preferable to freedom. Christ has come back on earth and is listening to the Grand Inquisitor's arguments and makes no rebuttal. Uh, I won't say what he does instead, but it's a one-sided argument in the actual chapter of the Grand Inquisitor. After that's done, Dostoevsky goes into great length to describe the Russian monk, in particular, Father Zosima, who gives sermons and whose life is one of virtue and is a counterpoint to the Grand Inquisitor. So it's a novel about faith and disbelief, what it is to believe in something, and man's quest for something to believe in. So the cover uh, shows a monk on his way to a church or a monastery and it's representing the quest that the reader and the author are engaged in as they search for truth. Yeah, I think it was the quest aspect of the book that made it, in my opinion, the best book I've ever read. Um, this, particularly the few chapters kind of in the middle um, where Alyosha's um, kind of recording Father Zosima's uh, life. Um, the, the, that's what kind of stood out to me in the book. Mm -hmm. But um, do you think that the Grand Inquisitor uh, scene was kind of prophetic of the direction Russia was going in? Well, I don't know that it was prophetic. It certainly has been vindicated by recent events. Uh, Dostoevsky was very concerned that his portrayal of the Russian monk, both his life and his sermons, which uh, Alyosha records in the book, would counterbalance the argument of the Grand Inquisitor. He was afraid that the Grand Inquisitor's case would be so powerful that men would be swept away, readers would be swept away by it and begin to doubt their beliefs. Um, whether, whether they did or they didn't is a matter open for discussion. But Dostoevsky's letters are full of his doubts that he was successful in posing the counter to the Grand Inquisitor's arguments. I, I feel like he did, but to me, the chapter that stood out the most was actually the one that immediately precedes the Grand Inquisitor one when Ivan is just, he basically says it, and let me, and tell me if this is a uh, good enough summary of Ivan's argument that chapter was that if God requires the suffering of innocent children to review his truth, then the price is too high and he rejects that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's the most common argument I hear from atheists for why they just don't believe in it. And I feel like Dostoevsky does a good job giving the devil his due in that chapter. And it's, um, he, he takes that argument seriously. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's, it was a disturbing chapter to me as well, to, yeah, as I read it. Um, so uh, to Dostoevsky's credit, he, you kind of know where, what his personal beliefs are reading the book, but he also 
you know, he really gives the devils due, I thought, that chapter. It's a very fair summary. There's also the devil's appearance in Ivan's nightmare, uh, in which he belittles Ivan and his arguments and his grand inquisitor. And um, Dostoevsky gives the devil his own say, you know, in a chapter called Ivan's nightmare. So that's also an impressive piece. Yeah. Uh, what was the first translation you read? Yeah. What would be crime of what? Of the brothers? Of, uh, yeah, the brothers Karamazov. Gosh, um, I think it was David Magershack. Okay. Yeah, he, I think that was, it was the uh, Penguin paperback edition. And then when I started teaching the brothers Karamazov, I used Kabir and Volokhonsky's translation, which served its purpose, but I think is overly literal and um, awkward to read. Really? So I decided to do my own. Great. Um, I, I read the Constance Scarnet translation uh -huh. first that's one that's one of the classics the oldest one i think yes um i found that actually found the ivan's nightmare seemed kind of hard to follow in that translation but otherwise i kind of have a soft spot for it because um she wasn't a contemporary of dostoevsky she was about 40 years younger um, right but and she i think she translated it maybe 30 some years after uh, it's published but i i Feel like her translation kind of it feels old-fashioned it's and i think it kind of captures maybe the tone of the literature of the time um and she was also kind of a character from what i understand she was yes, she's she blind and uh from what she i was? she was blind she was i didn't know that yeah uh, is she her maybe method, she went blind. yeah uh, she would have someone read it to her and then she would yeah. dictate the translation Hmm. Um, so is in uh, from what I know about her, she's also kind of a kind of an eccentric person. So I just have a soft spot for her and her well, translation. Her service to Russian literature is extremely valuable. She translated everything. Yeah. And uh, hmm, I don't know how she had time for it all, but her translations are very serviceable. I think that I mean she didn't know Russian as well as we know it now. So there are inaccuracies. There are what translators like to call infelicities, strange collocations, strange expressions. Um, and other than that, I mean, it's a bit ant antiquated and old fashioned. Some people like it, the Victorian English into which she translates it my version is more accessible to the contemporary American reader now. Uh, students and general readers who want to read it in um, American English that's not too colloquial or slang, but standard American. I also think the standard at the time wasn't to do literal translations that that people weren't expecting it, the amount of fidelity that we do today. Mm -hmm. um, so what would someone who had already read another translation get out of reading your translation? Well, I tried to emphasize Dostoevsky's humor. I think Pavir and Volokhonsky and both Constance Garnett miss his tongue-in-cheek dark humor and uh, he's he can be very funny and the father Fyodor Karamazov is something of a buffoon and both his speech and his actions indicate that about his behavior um so also the the devil when he appears to Ivan is a real comedian. He's like a stand-up comic making his arguments and trying to embarrass Ivan. So I would say humor is one thing. And the other thing is 
the elevated language of Father Zosima. He's a monk, and when he speaks Russian, he mixes it with a great deal of Church Slavic, which is the parent language of Russian, much like Latin is the parent language of the Romance languages and used to be the language of the Catholic Church until the 1960s when it was dethroned. Um, but Zosima mixes in Old Church Slavic and I think that other translations miss the flavor of the church language. Well, I'm glad you're reinserting the humor. I didn't get a lot of humor out of other translations I've read of Dostoevsky, maybe a bit in the Notes from Underground. Uh, to me, the, the underground man kind of comes off as like a George Costanza type. He, uh -huh. I just kind of picture him like just his pettiness um, is... I was, I was kind of casting him as as uh, George Costanza when I read that, but the other translations he comes off as kind of humorless, and yes. in the translations I've read of, of Tolstoy, uh, I do get like a lot of tongue in cheek from Tolstoy that I kind of missed in Dostoevsky. But if you've reinserted that, I uh, to me that's a selling point. Well, the um, the funniest of Dostoevsky's novels, the most humorous is devils or demons or the possessed translated under all three titles and that one is has got some really comic scenes in it i haven't read that one but they're they're all online. translated that in the 80s and it was published by oxford university press okay. is that so still in print were... so yes uh-huh okay great um... i think it may even be on audible okay great i'll get that on my to read list. I think uh, the next, well, after I reread uh, your translation of Karen was off, I think my next one is uh, The Idiot. Would be, mm -hmm. uh, the next one I plan to read. But uh, I, I hope to get through all of them in my lifetime. Well, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'd like to ask you how to read the book. I think, uh, well, the first time I read it, like I said, I gave up on it halfway. Other Russian books I read, especially when I was younger, I had a really hard time with uh, the cast of characters, the uh, first name, patronym, surname, diminutives, um, and just how sprawling they were. Do you have a recommendation on how someone reading this for the first time would approach it? Sure. In my uh, translation, I include a list of characters and notes on the, the meaning of their names, um, which is important to keep in mind as one reads. Um, the first hundred pages are difficult. I have no doubt about that. If you can make it through a hundred pages when the action of the book actually begins, then you're doing very well. And the ideas that I presented earlier the overview of the novel, I should help the reader get into it. That is, the three brothers, the murder of the father, and the search for the culpability of each of the three, as well as the search for religious faith. So I think that's enough to start. I wrote an introduction, and if you're not afraid of spoilers, there's a brief introduction to the book. I tried to put the spoilers in a separate piece called The Afterword, in which I reveal what I think the novel is really about, but that's at the end of the book and not at the beginning. I would Xerox the list of characters and use that folded in half and use it as a place marker. Well, that's smart. Because there uh, are lots of names. Yeah. I, I tend to leave out the patronymics when I can and just do the first name, but um, there are diminutives and then affectionate diminutives and uh, pejorative diminutives. It's a beautiful language. I would say compared to like War and Peace, the cast of characters in Karamaz office is, is uh, pretty limited, um, but you can kind of lose sight of that when you've think that 
of all the names and patronyms and the diminutives, it might seem like there are more characters than there actually are. Um, the, the way I I did it was uh, after each chapter, I would just close the book and then I wrote down from memory what happened in that chapter. And um, and then I'd go back and read and reread that before I went on to the next chapter. Um, and and uh, um, with the characters, I was consistent with the name. So um, I always said like Alyosha, not just, you know, Alexei or Alexei uh -huh. Fyodorovich or like or Karamazov or, um, you know, that helped me just keep it all straight in my head. And I think there's only one point where I was like, Hey, who is this character again? Um, mm -hmm. But that that helped me. It's um, yeah. I, I feel like this next time I read it, it'll be a faster read. With now that I'm familiar with the story, and um, I won't have to do that, and I, I'll be able to breeze through it. But I agree that the first hundred pages um, are a bit leisurely. It kind of mm -hmm. eases into the story, but um, I'd highly re recommend reading the whole book. Obviously. <laughs> um, so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I understand that, that this was supposed to be the first of a trilogy that uh, Dostoevsky had planned. I don't want to get this video flagged for misinformation. Is that correct? <laughs> um, that that's what he said. He indicates that in the his own introduction to the novel. I don't think that was true. I think that was if it was ever his intention, there are no notes, no schemes, no outlines left, which would indicate he was thinking about moving on. Unlike Tolstoy, where with War and Peace, he had plans to write more. So we have sketches and some drafts of chapters. With Dostoevsky, we have nothing except the, in, the indication at the beginning that he plans to write more. So I tend to, to disbelieve that. I think that it's it has been said by some critics that Dostoevsky really wrote one novel his entire life, whether he called it Crime and Punishment, The Idiot, The Devils, or Brothers Karamazov, and that he just snipped off the prose when he finished or got long enough and he would write the next one. But basically he's dealing with the same themes in all five of his major works. That is belief and disbelief and the search for Christ and faith. He starts in Notes from Underground, but in Notes from Underground, the censors removed from his manuscript the reference to, to Jesus and to faith. And he was furious that it had been eliminated, but he never restored it to the manuscript. So Notes from Underground has no indication of the religious theme in Dostoevsky. You think it possible because he died so soon after finishing it that that's why there's no schemes for the sequels? If he really planned to write it, yes. Right, he didn't live long enough to do anything. Um, my own theory is um, that that he may have had something in mind, like probably a treatment in his head. Um, I've heard one commentary where they mentioned the the chapters involving or that whole section involving Kolya, um, mm -hmm. the, the, the kind boys. of troublemaker boy. Um, yeah, that it was kind of feels out of place in the book, especially where it's placed. And it's kind of a diversion from the story. So um, one, do you agree with that? And second, um, my my theory is that he was maybe setting that character up to be in a bigger character in a future book. Possible, we'll never know. Yeah. When we meet him, when we meet him in the afterlife, we can say, hey, Fyodor Mikhailovich. So what were you really planning to do? and see what he has to say. Maybe maybe you're right that he was just a, just giving us a tease. Um, this book seems to have um, kind of a universal appeal from people I've known 
who've read it from other cultures or like Muslims or Jews. Who, and I, at first I had a hard time understanding that because it, like this kind of dark book with all this Jesus stuff in it, I don't see how it would appeal to someone, but what is your theory? Well, um, my theory about what, why it has why, such why, it's, why it would appeal to um, say non-Western non, readers. Non-Christians. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think the main theme, which is the search for truth and the search for faith is universal. Muslims, Jews, Hindus, everyone is looking for God and how to serve him and looking for the answer to the life, the meaning of life. Uh, Dostoevsky deals with big questions. There's no doubt about it. Tolstoy tends to deal with more everyday issues, marriage, the rights of women, raising children, the death of a parent, the death of a spouse. Those are actual crises which Tolstoy tends to deal with, both in War and Peace and Anna Karenina. Dostoevsky is not interested in those questions. He's more interested in the big issues of life. What is truth? What is faith? Who is God? Does God exist? Does the devil exist? These are what Dostoevsky concerns himself with. Um, who would win in a fight? Raskolnikov or Smerdyakov? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What's your guess? I think Smerdyakov would fight dirty, so uh, he would probably win. <laughs> well, it's curious that, well, we don't want to say what Smerdyakov, how Smerdyakov ends, but um, Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, the notebooks to Crime and Punishment, blows his brains out several times. Mm -hmm. Dostoevsky writes, he went off and shot himself. Um, and then in the next page in the notebooks, Raskolnikov is back, wondering what to do next, yeah. going to his friend Razumihin, going to see the lawyer, the manage the um, magistrate, examining magistrate Porfiry Petrovich, and then again, Dostoevsky writes, he gets into such a pickle that he blows his brains out. But that isn't the ending of the novel. So Dostoevsky keeps bringing him back and says, no, I need him. I need him. He's not going to commit suicide. Yeah. We don't want to give any spoilers on these 150-year-old books. So, right. Um, well, well, what are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? A book entitled Anton the Luckless, which is by the author Grigorovich, uh, who's writing in the middle of the 19th century, 1840s, and who's describing peasant life. It's a novel about a peasant who undergoes a series of trials and tribulations and has a hard time of it. It's the first book in Russian literature to deal with peasants as human beings. Uh, approximately what year was that written? 40s, late 40s. Okay. He precedes Turgenev's Notes of the Hunter. And that's an important book also for portraying peasants as real human beings. So this is a peasant's life. Anton the Luckless. I don't have a publisher yet. I'm just starting work on it, and okay. uh, we'll see where it goes. Okay. Uh, has that been translated before? Once. Okay. Um, in 1982, I believe, by a man named Mike Persglove, uh, who did a, a very good job at it, but I think it's time for another translation. Yeah. I feel like the translations need to be updated every every few decades. Yes, um, I think so. His is also very British, and I translate for an American audience. Right. All right. Um, I think that does it for me. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, is there anything though you would add, or you wish I had asked you? I think you did a good job. 
I think we covered most of it. Um, my own background, how I got into Russian, how I got into translating. Oh, I might say the way I got into translating, uh, I had never translated anything. I didn't think of myself as a translator. And I was teaching a course of undergraduates on Russian intellectual history and referring to a book by Alexander Herzen called Who is to Blame, which was the first book I translated, uh, which is out of print, unfortunately. And um, I kept referring to the book and saying, if this book had been translated, we'd be reading it. And one of my students raised his hand and said, why don't you stop saying that and you translate it? And I said, because I'm not a translator. And I got to thinking, what is a translator? Why couldn't I translate it? Began looking up who had done other translations and found that there were a number of faculty at universities who translated. So I tried my hand at it. And not only was it fun to do, but I turned out I was good at it because I won a prize for that very first book I translated from the Translation Center at Columbia University. So um, I kept at it. And I've been now I've got over 20 books that I've translated. I'm not up to Constance Garnett's number, but um, who knows how long I'll live and whether I can match hers, we'll see. I'll say I'm not a podcaster, but that didn't stop me. Um, well, is there a, well, can people pre-order it? Do you have a website where it can be pre-ordered? I don't have a website, but it's on Amazon okay. or and can be pre-ordered or it's on the Norton Publishers website. Okay. So you can do, go two ways. Yeah, I so saw it was available for pre-order, but I didn't want to plug one one person who's selling your book over another. But I'll go ahead and put the the link to pre-order it. And okay, uh, I'd appreciate that. And uh, I'll remind people to uh, smash the like button and also hit subscribe to help me get to one million subscribers. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing the interview. I appreciate it. Well, I appreciate you. You've been very responsive and uh, very generous, and I really appreciate you and your new enjoy, translation. Enjoy the translation when you get to it, and um, let me know what you think of it. I sure will. Thank you very much. Sure. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.